Okay. Book of Colossians, chapter 2. Jeffy. Turn it down just a hair. Okay. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to continue that series today. The book of Colossians tells a lot about Jesus Christ and how awesome he is. And I hope today you get a little bit more of a picture of how awesome Jesus is and when we understand that, how much of an impact it can have on our life. So we're in Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 1 through 10 and then uh, teach a few things about that. Colossians 2 verse 1. It says, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you. And we talked before about how Paul was struggling really in prayer and in his teaching to help these people recognize how awesome Jesus Christ is because they were, this church was being uh, put in a position where they were being deceived or being drawn away from Jesus Christ or adding things to their salvation other than Jesus. And Paul was concerned about them. And so he says, I'm struggling for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. And here's his purpose. My purpose is that they would be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have full riches of complete understanding. You know, he uses all these terms that are like to the nth degree, full riches, complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. See, at the end of this, he's saying, I want them to know Jesus Paul, what'd you do to that baby over there? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think you left him, and he got sad. That's why you're supposed to stay out of the nursery, Paul. All right. I love the sound of children crying. Oh, that's not Jackson. All right. My purpose is they would be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they can have full riches of complete understanding in order they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I'm absent from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are, and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and then overflowing with thankfulness. And then once again, he gives this kind of a warning. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. You have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority." Lord, I pray this morning as we look into your word that you make it come alive to us all. Lord Jesus, you are the teacher. Your Holy Spirit, the anointing, is the teacher. That This morning I trust that you will teach your people here, Lord Jesus. Open all of our eyes to understand, or if we're being refreshed about something we've already heard, make it real to us, Lord. And help us to see Jesus more clearly because we see your word more clearly. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, when he starts out, I'm going to talk to you about four things in this portion of Scripture. He starts out by saying the whole purpose of his struggle with these people, struggling for them, is that they may know Christ. 
Now, you think about this. When we talk about knowing somebody, there are different degrees of knowing. I mean, for example, if I ask you today, how many of you know President Obama? I think everybody would raise your hand. We all know him. We know who he is. If he walked down the street, we would recognize him. But we know him at some level. But if I ask you, do you know him in the same way you know your best friend or in the same way you know your husband or in the same way you know your wife, the answer would be no. There's a, there's a deeper and a more intimate knowledge that's part of knowing people. And when Paul talks about this idea of knowing Jesus, knowing Christ, it's the Greek word that means to fully know him, to know him to completeness, to almost to perfection, to know him deeply and intimately. It's a very, very strong word in the Greek language. A definition out of the, the uh, Greek dictionaries is the, a full, perfect, and precise knowledge. And it's, it's also this, it's a knowledge that is more than intellectual. See, I think sometimes we settle for the fact that I know Jesus, I've heard stories about Jesus, I can re recite scriptures about Jesus, but he's after this idea of knowing Jesus, knowing him intimately, perfectly, perfectly, precisely. And it's an understanding when we have this knowledge, it actually begins to affect my life. The Bible says, or not the Bible, but one of these dictionaries says the Greek word epignosis, which is what we're talking about here, controls and directs our behavior. The idea is this, that I know Jesus in such a way, so deeply, that it affects the way I live. And I think sometimes we fail as Christians to enter into that kind of knowledge. We, we settle for the intellectual knowledge. We settle for knowing the stories but he calls us into this deeper knowledge. I I've been saved now al almost 41 years. It'll be 41 years here in August. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, the, the Christian life for me has been one of constantly learning more about Jesus. I know more about him today than I ever have, but I know there's so much more to know. The day I got saved, I knew that Jesus loved me. I knew that he forgave me. I knew that he accepted me. There was an immediate light bulb was turned on about what I knew of him. But through my struggles, through my trials, through interpersonal relationships, through reading God's word, through worship, through just life's experiences, both good and bad, I've learned about him. I've learned more about him. I mean, an example, you might be reading in the Bible one day and you read the story where it says, Jesus said, let the little children come to me. And all of a sudden, the light bulb comes on in your head and you say, man, Jesus loves children. I never realized that before. And, and as, you, as you learn to walk with him, you start knowing him more perfectly. And hopefully, that knowledge of Jesus begins to have an impact on how you live your life. And that's what Paul was asking about for these people. He says, I'm struggling that you may know him, know him. Let me share with you a couple of scriptures where knowledge of God and how we live our life are linked together. They're kind of inseparable. Here's one in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, and this is in the negative sense. It says, there were some people there who did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. See, there were some people here in, in, the, in, the, in Rome who did not want to retain this deeper knowledge, this epignosis. For whatever reason, they pushed it away. And the Bible says here, because they did not retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind. They pushed him away and something happened in their mind. God gave them over to a depraved mind and it says, so that they do what ought not to be done. You see, they were doing things that shouldn't have been done and it was partly due because they didn't have the knowledge of God. They, they pushed the knowledge of God away from them and it led to this depraved mind 
and doing what should not be done. Now, here's one on the positive side, where you, the knowledge of God affects us in a positive way. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. It says, grace and peace be yours in abundance through what? The knowledge of God. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God. You need grace, you need peace, it's through the knowledge of God. And of Jesus our Lord. It says in verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. How many of you have ever struggled to live a godly life? Can I see your hands, please? Okay, let me share with you what the Bible says. He has given us everything we need to live a godly life. How many believe that? We still struggle, but we've been, we've been given everything we need for the godly life. Through what? Through our knowledge of him. Isn't that amazing that somehow... Through our knowledge of him, this is that word we're talking about, through our knowledge of him, it begins to affect my life in such a way that I'm living the godly life he's calling me to. But it's in knowing Jesus. That's the pursuit of our life as Christians, to come to know him more and more intimately. And again, not just knowing about him, knowing him. It's amazing to me that we can know somebody we can't see. But he lives inside of us. That is the hope of glory. Christ in us is the hope of glory. He lives inside of me. Everywhere I go, he's with me. He speaks to us. He teaches us. And through my knowledge of him, through our knowledge of him, we find that we have everything we need for a godly life. Isn't that a lot better to pursue knowing Jesus than to pursue the things that those other teachers were calling Colossians to? To keep the Sabbath, keep the feast, keep the new moons, keep these uh, other traditions, the asceticism, the fasting, the hardships. See, none of those things really bring about this kind of knowledge of Jesus Christ that he calls us to. Matter of fact, it detracts and takes, us, takes it away from us. Look at Philippians 3, verse 8, if you would. The knowledge of God is a lifelong pursuit. I mean, if you, if you think you know him now, and you do to some degree, I want you to understand that God is bigger than our knowledge. And even though you've been saved for 40 or 50 or 80 years, there's still much more of him to know. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul the Apostle is writing, and now if you think of a person in the, in the Bible that you would think knows Jesus, it would be Paul. I mean, he walked with him, he learned from him, he, he was submitted to him, he yielded to him. He didn't walk with him, like, physically, but he walked with him. He, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Jesus had died by the time Paul became a Christian, but he knew him intimately. And yet, in this book, in Philippians, he says, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, the thing that Paul had beating in his heart that he wanted, that he thought was of the greatest value, was to lay everything else aside. I just want to know Jesus. I want to know him. And he, he speaks here that for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, a righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then he says that I may know him. And that's this word we're talking about. You know, Paul the Apostle knew Jesus as well as any of us. And yet he's saying, I still want to know him. I want to dig deeper. I want to lay everything else aside because I want to really know him. I want to know him completely. I want to know him Perfectly, I want to know him with precise knowledge. And so Paul was in his Christian life pursuing knowing Jesus. What is it that we're pursuing in life? What is our goal in our Christian walk? I hope that after today we can say, you know what? The greatest goal in my Christian life is not to be a great preacher or teacher, not to be a great evangelist, not to be a great worship leader, not to be a great servant, 
to know Jesus. I want to know Him more. The word that this is built on, this gnosis or epignosis, is actually a word that also has some, uh, some sexual content to it. So think about this. I'm not being weird. Don't be, I'm not being weird on you guys. But listen to this for a minute. In Luke chapter 1, verse 34, where it says, when the, when the angel came to Mary and said, you're going to have a son, she said back to the angel, how shall this be, seeing I don't know a man? And that word know is what we're talking about. And when she was saying, I don't know a man, she was talking about, I haven't had that intimate relationship with a man that could even produce a child. And so the knowing has, has this quality of intimacy to it that you experience in a marriage. And that's a unique kind of knowing, isn't it? I mean, we know a lot of people, we have friends, we know people, and we start knowing people at different levels, but we have a certain knowledge with our spouse, with nobody else but our spouse. And that's kind of what's there with our relationship to Jesus. He calls us to this intimate knowing. As a matter of fact, the Bible describes at times the relationship between Christ and the church as a bride and a groom. And so part of our knowing him is to know him intimately. And again, I don't, I mean, you guys have to figure out on your own how to implement that. I'm just saying there's something about intimacy that Jesus Christ wants to have with us. He doesn't want to be on the shelf. He doesn't want to be just something we do on a Sunday morning. He wants to be on our minds and in our hearts. He wants us to be living for him. An intimate relationship. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is the love chapter, you guys know that, verse 12, that we see in a mirror dimly. And he's talking about our life now, but also a future state. We see right now in a mirror dimly. When I see Jesus, when I think of Jesus, when I try to understand Jesus, I know I'm, I, it's a little bit clouded. I'm seeing through a mirror that's dim. And I want to I try to wipe that away. You know, I want to try to get the, the smudge off that or whatever's in the way. I want to be able to see that. But right now, we do see through a mirror dimly. But then, face to face, you know, I can't wait to the day. I mean, you're going to walk up and look right in his face, Bill. <laughs> You know what? I mean, the thing that we think about, we talk about Jesus and we, we worship him, we pray to him, we love him, and we read his word and he has this relationship with us. One day, I mean, this is, it's, I mean, I hate to say what you always say, Bill, but this thing is real. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you know when Bill Powell preaches, that phrase is going to come out somewhere? <laughs> because he just believes in it. And the thing is, we'll see him face to face. And I'll tell you what, it's going to just blow our mind. It's going to blow our mind. I will see him face to face. He says, now I know in part. I don't know everything. We know in part, but then I shall know fully. Isn't that awesome? It's like those guys in, on the road to Demaeus, that they, their eyes were open. They, they, they didn't see something, then they saw it. Right now I know in part, but then I'm going to know fully. And it's going to be an awesome day. And it says, I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. How fully will you know Jesus? As fully as he knows you. That's everything. Praise God for that. So there's a couple things in this chapter I read in these, these ten verses I want to draw your attention to, but I believe they're tied to our knowing of him and having that kind of relationship. And the first one is, found in verses 3. And that is, it says, in whom, or in Christ, in him, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you believe that? All, how many of you know the Greek word all means what? All. Okay. <laughs> all the treasures 
of wisdom are in him. If I'm seeking for wisdom, where do I want to go? See, I don't want to go to the internet. I don't want to go to the experts in any field. I want to go to Jesus because in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The problem with us sometimes is we, we uh, look at the scripture and we say, yeah, well, I know what the Bible says, but, and then we throw in one of those bad buts. It's a, that's a bad but right there. We say, I know the Bible says that, but instead I think I'm going to do this, or I tried that, it doesn't work for me, or, you know, we have these, these statements we make that don't make a bit of sense because in him are all the treasures of wisdom. And I, and I think that God wants us all to have at the foundation, at the core of our inner man, that I believe that Jesus is the source of all wisdom. I believe that. If I'm looking for answers in life, this is where I'm searching. I don't know about you guys, but I hope that, I hope that you will. I hope that you'll say, wonder what Jesus says about it. What does Jesus teach about this? Because a lot of the experts that are out there don't have any clue about who he is. And the Bible says in him is all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There's a scripture in Psalm 119, verse 128. It says, therefore I esteem all your precepts concerning all things to be right. I hope you'll believe that. I hope that you can settle that issue. That if you read the Bible and you find in the Bible something that disagrees with you, guess who's wrong? <laughs> right. God is always right. And so there's these foundational stones built into our, our inner man that say, hey, I just simply believe that his word is true. I believe that he is the source of all wisdom. And so when I'm seeking for answers for my life, I want to go to Jesus Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There's a question. Where is the wise man? This is 1 Corinthians 1 verse 20. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God, listen to this, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So you're seeing in this scripture three different wisdoms talked about. The wisdom of God, the wisdom of the world, and the wisdom of man. Okay? And so it says, first of all, God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. Why would I run there for the answers in my life? If God has made it foolish, why would I think I want to build my life on it? I want to come to true wisdom. I want to come to the wisdom that's found in Jesus Christ. God has made the wisdom of this world foolish, for since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, would never know him. The world in its wisdom will never know him. And God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand a sign. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jew and Greek, Christ is the power of God and Christ is the wisdom of God. And it says there, the foolishness of God, the foolishness of God, is wiser than human wisdom. Take the foolish, the most foolish thing that God, that's about God, whatever that is. I mean, who could even identify that? But the foolishness of God is greater than any human wisdom. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here's another one. In James chapter 3, verse 13, hear this, please. Hear this one, because this is important. Sometimes when we think of wisdom, we think of our ability to make strategic decisions, you know, like playing a chess game. I'm going to think ahead. I'm going to make a wise choice. I'm making a wise decision. I'm making wise moves in my life. But I think you'll see in the Scripture that God's wisdom, more than that, that may be an element of it, but it actually is about how I live my life. Listen to what this says here. Again, the question is, who is wise? I'm in James 3, verse 13. Who is wise 
and understanding among you. Let them show it by what? By their good life. A person who's wise has a good life. There's something of, of the wisdom of Jesus Christ that has been imparted to this person that begins to impact them and change them, and now their life is, is reflecting something of knowing him. Who is wise, let him show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that come from wisdom. But listen to this, verse 14. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, and it's in quotes in the NIV version, such wisdom does not come down from heaven. But it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Wow, that sounds weird, doesn't it? We talked about human wisdom. We talked about worldly wisdom. And now here he's talking about earthly wisdom, which is probably the same as worldly wisdom, unspiritual wisdom, and demonic wisdom. Or the wisdom of Christ. Which one do you want? But can you see here that he's saying that the way that we're living our life tells us which wisdom that we have embraced. Who is wise? Let him show it by his good life. And if you are walking with envy and bitterness and selfish ambition in your heart, listen, you're walking in a different wisdom. It's not the one that's come from heaven. It may be earthly, it may be unspiritual, it may be demonic, but it's not of the Lord. And so the more I know Jesus, and the more I look to him for wisdom, the more it's changing my life and how I relate to people around me. God's wisdom changes me because it's who Jesus is. He is the wisdom of God. In Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus also answered the question, who is wise? He said this, Matthew 7, verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Amen? Who is a wise man? I'm hearing what Jesus is saying. He is the source of wisdom. All the treasure of wisdom is found in him. And so if I'm going to be wise, I want to hear what he has to say and actually begin to walk in it. I'm becoming wise because I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm actually adding to my life the teachings of Jesus Christ. He's building his house upon a rock. The rains come down, the winds blow, beat against the house, and so on. You know the story. Verse 26, everyone who hears the words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who's building on the sand. So, so you see, wisdom and foolishness there is really dependent upon one thing, isn't it? Both of them here... Both of them have storms come against their life. The rains come against both houses. The streams rise against both houses. The only difference between this person and that person is who is walking in the things they're hearing. He who hears my words and puts them into practice, solid foundation. You hear them and don't, you're building on sand. Isn't that good? <laughs> I mean, the Word of God is good. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying anything about me here. I'm saying the Word of God is good. The next thing he says in verse 6, in Colossians 2, verse 6, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, continue to walk in Him. There's a teaching that's out there today, and I, you know, I, I hear it, where people say, well, I received Jesus as my Savior, but not my Lord. I don't really think you can receive him unless you receive him as your Lord. How can you receive him as your Savior? And say, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the Lordship later on. <laughs> he is the Lord. When you, when you come and receive him, you're receiving who he is. You're not saying, give me this half of you, Lord. I'll take the Savior side because I don't want to go to hell when I die. 
but I don't really, I, I think I still want to do my own thing in life for a while. I don't want to come under the lordship of Jesus. And the Bible tells us here that as you received Christ as Lord, continue to walk in that. And so part of us uh, knowing Jesus and walking closely with him and becoming more aware of who he is, is surrendering to his lordship and continuing in it. It's like a journey. All of us have trials. All of us have hardships. But we see people who begin with the Lord and don't continue. You know the story of the parable of the sower and the seed, where sometimes seed falls upon the rocky ground, and it grows up for a while, and it has life, but then because its roots weren't deep, and the sun comes out and trials come, it begins to wither and die. Or you have some seed that falls upon the thorny ground, and it grows up for a little while. There's life there. It begins to grow. It has some green things, and all of a sudden... The weeds and things choke it out. And he said, this is, this is the seed that falls into the world. And the cares of this life begin to choke it out. And it dies. Some of us don't continue. I pray that we'll continue, everybody here. You will continue as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord. Continue in that. Continue in that. He talks in that portion of Scripture about being rooted in Christ What's that sound like to you? Rooted. What's that? Yeah, you're getting your, your your roots are getting your nourishment. You're getting an anchor into the ground. You're you're getting water. You're you're supplying yourself. We're rooted in Christ. It says we're built up in Christ. It's like a building, a foundation blocks, and we're building up in Him. These these things bring stability to us. You know, how do we get rooted in Christ? Well, part of it is as we're rooted in, in Christ in his love. We're, we're rooted by spending time in his word. We're built up by spiritual gifts. We're built up by encouraging one another. We're edified by the word of God. We, we actually can encourage and edify each other. But there are many different avenues or ways that God has designed for us to be rooted and to be built up, but we've got to apply ourselves to them. I, I want to be rooted in Christ. I don't want to be shaken. He says to be confirmed or strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. One thing I've noticed about people that have walked with the Lord for many years and they know Jesus is they're just thankful people. They're just full of joy. There's a, there's a contentment and a settledness that comes into their life. And when you're around them, you just feel happy. You know, they're not like some great prophet. They're not giving you any great... I mean, have you ever met someone like this? And maybe you, you meet an old person who knows Jesus. And they've walked with Jesus for 70 years, and they're just like, they just know him. And when you're around them, it just oozes all over you. It's like, man, I don't know what it is, but I just like being around that person. Well, it's Jesus. And they're full of joy. They're full of thankfulness. There's something about walking with Jesus that has had such an impact upon their life. And I love being around those people. I hope I can be one. And finally, he said, in Christ all the fullness, in verse 9, in Christ all the fullness of the, the deity lives in bodily form. Everything that God is, Jesus Christ is. Don't ever think that Jesus was created or that Jesus was only a man. He was God who became a man. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. Most, most cults that are out there today teaching some other form of Christianity will either diminish Jesus Christ or exalt man wrongly. He's God. He's the creator. We learned all that in Colossians chapter 1. He's trying to show them the preeminence of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. And he says, I want you to know that in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives. There's nothing that is God that wasn't in Jesus. And look at the side effect of this. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Some versions say you are complete in him. Now, I want to talk about this for just a moment and we'll close. But I, I believe that the, the idea of being complete in Christ is speaking here in this context specifically about our salvation. There's nothing more that I need to be saved. I don't need Jewish ritual. I don't need fastings and prayers. I don't need new moons and Sabbaths. I don't need human philosophy or tradition. All I need is Jesus. 
It's his blood that cleanses us. It's his blood that takes away my sin. What is it that I can add to my salvation? Lord, if, I, if I'm more diligent in my prayer life, won't that add to my salvation? No. Well, what if I go to church more often? Won't that add to my salvation? Not really. Well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to fast for 40 days. Won't that add to my salvation? Absolutely not. There's nothing you can add to it. We are complete in Jesus. You've got to come to the place where you're settled in your heart. It doesn't mean that we don't want to spend time in his word. I mean, we do that because we love him. How many of you guys, let me ask you a question, ever got a love letter from a girl? Let me see your hand. Be honest with me. What did you do with it? It's like, oh, yeah, love letter. (laughs) No, 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 no. Here's what you're doing. Oh, wow. Wonder what, what did she mean by that? What did she mean by that? I've never heard words like this before. This is so, so awesome. I got to read between the lines here. I'm going to save this and read it again one day. See? That's how I look at the Bible. <laughs> So I know that complete in him has to do with my salvation. But I I couldn't help this week as I was reading, as I was studying this and thinking about this idea of being complete in Jesus, that it maybe has other application, and that is somehow Jesus really does satisfy everything in our life, the emptiness of our life. You know who I was thinking about this week was Bruce Jenner. And when I saw the story about how he became a woman, you know, where he changed himself to become a woman, I thought, man, how empty can a person be to feel that if I could just do this, I'll be complete. But I can tell you this, I believe that today he's just as empty. Because see, it didn't touch his spirit. He touched his body, he touched his face, but deep inside, it was never touched by anything he went through. And in some ways, you know, I I know that I can't draw a true parallel here, but in some ways, we're we're all like Bruce Jenner, and that is that we think that there's something else out there that's going to really complete me. If I just had that, if I just had this, if I could just do that, that somehow, you know, I'll find completeness. And it's, it really, honestly, is only found in Jesus Christ. When you can come to the place where Jesus completes you and you have a satisfaction of that relationship, there's nothing really you need from other people. It's not that you don't care, but you, there's no leverage there. It's not like I don't have an expectation If you offend me, so what, I got offended. You don't complete me anyhow. Jesus does. You know what I mean? Jesus completes us. And so when we can can come to that place in our heart where Jesus completes us, it brings such a satisfaction, such a peace, such a, I don't know, I don't even know how to, tranquility to life. You know, we showed that video at the very beginning. It's not about who you are, what you've done, what people say about you, what you think about yourself. It's really being complete in him. So I'd like you to stand with me, and we're going to close in prayer. I just want to rehearse again some things I wrote down, just kind of summarizing these points. And that is, my prayer is that we would come to know him intimately, that that would be a desire of your heart, to know Jesus more intimately and grow in your knowledge of him year after year. I pray for us that we would all believe that the wisdom comes from Jesus Christ. That he is the treasure of all wisdom and knowledge. It's found in him. And so when we're looking for answers in life, we go to the source of true wisdom rather than being duped by a wisdom that God calls foolishness. Third thing I'm praying for is that we would all 
walk under the lordship of Jesus. As you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue in that. He is my Lord. The Lord word Lord means controller. He is my Lord. And then finally, may we rest in the fullness of Christ. May he be the one who completes us in every regard. That if there's an emptiness in your soul, an emptiness in your heart, may you find it in Jesus Christ. You know, we have so many people, even in the Christian world, that get caught up in addictions. They're looking for, they're looking to fill an emptiness. It's only Jesus that can really, truly meet that need. And so, Lord Jesus, just like Paul prayed for the Colossian church, I pray for ours, for us, Lord Jesus, that you help us to know you with this intimate knowledge that you spoke about here. Let us truly look to you for wisdom in this world. Let us surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And let us all find our completeness in you, Lord. I pray that you would just be magnified in each of our eyes and in our hearts. And that the pursuit of our life, like the Apostle Paul, would be that I may know him. I ask you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Okay.